And now let me introduce my guest. Richard Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist. He is currently the Charles Simoni Professor of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. He is the author of many books, including The Selfish Gene and The Blind Watchmaker. His new book is The God Delusion. He joins me from the BBC studios in Oxford. And welcome back to Science Friday, Dr. Dawkins. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's very kind to have you here. Now, uh, okay, you wrote this book with the hope that uh, people picking it up, religious people picking it up, uh, will be atheists when they put it down. Um, first of all, what do you think the chances are of that? That's a fairly ambitious hope. Some might say almost ridiculously so. I know that I'm not going to change the minds of dyed-in-the-wool faith heads. Uh, and uh, to some extent, I may be preaching to the choir, um, to those um, a- atheists who do read it. I do think, though, that there probably is a large middle ground of people who have always sort of been vaguely religious because they were brought up that way, but probably haven't given it much thought, probably because they've got better things to do. And maybe some of them, reading my book, will be moved to think again, think hard, think it through, and maybe come to the conclusion that, in fact, the religion in which they were brought up is a lot of nonsense. Now, as I read the book, it seemed to me that a lot of the arguments were not necessarily arguments that had to be made by a scientist. I mean, a sociologist could look at many of the points you make about the various, um, uh, as you call them, negative aspects of religion and come to the same conclusion. Not to say that a sociologist isn't a scientist, I, I should hasten to add. But, but why as, are you, as an evolutionary biologist, particularly interested in taking up this topic? Well, that, that's a very good point, and a sociologist could indeed make the, the points in that part of the book, which is sort of the second half, where I discuss uh, some of the negative aspects of religion. However, the first half of the book is dominated by an argument against the existence of God, against the existence of a supernatural creator. That I regard as a scientific argument, and I don't think a sociologist would be the ideal person to make that argument. I do think that the existence of God is essentially a scientific question in the sense that a universe that contains a God would be a very different kind of universe, scientifically speaking, from a universe that does not contain a God. That, I think, is a scientific issue. It's not an issue that science can prove one way or the other, but it is an issue that I believe science can give a probability to. Right. I think I have to mention that in the last, uh, we've been talking also on this program about the uh, the physics Nobel Prize, which was given out this year to two American scientists who were looking at the um, the background radiation from the cosmic uh, from the Big Bang, and of course that's one of those places where you start to talk about the very origins of everything, and and God uh, often tends to come up, and and in your book you were you were talking about Einstein and his description of God, uh, and I wonder if you can talk about the difference between the kind of a God that Einstein was talking about and the kind of a God that you're trying to disprove the existence of. Yes, Einstein was indeed very fond of using the word God. He used it a lot. Uh, He was not, however, a theist in the sense that he did not believe in a personal God. He was extremely clear about that. Einstein was using the word God as a kind of name for that which we don't yet understand, the deep mystery which lies at the base of the universe. It was his kind of poetic, slightly jocular way of referring to the deep problems of physics which remain to be solved. Unfortunately, Einstein chose to use the word God, and an awful lot of people have misunderstood that to mean that Einstein was a theist. He certainly was not a a theist. Uh, But but I think I have to get a little closer. I mean, theist meaning someone who believes that there's some some greater... Yes, yes. A a personal God who does such things as listens to your prayers, forgives your sins, reads your thoughts, um, takes an interest in human affairs. A deist is someone who believes that there is a God, but that God purely uh, invented the laws of physics at the origin of the universe, invented the laws and constants of physics, uh, set the universe going, retired and did nothing more. Einstein, in my view, wasn't even a deist, although some people might claim that he was. He, says he certainly was not a theist. He was, he was adamant about that. He did not believe in a personal God who takes a personal interest in human affairs. 
So is there are there people that are considered atheists but not atheists? <laughs> is there such a word even? Um, yeah. And what would that mean? Yeah. Um, I think that an atheist would also be an... No, I, I suppose... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think... I've, I've never heard the word atheist no, of used. Not. I, I don't think I so. think that the word atheist usually tends to mean somebody who doesn't believe in any kind of God, even the deist God. Now, you talk about, uh, quite a lot about the, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, the persecution of, of atheists as people who are, uh, uh, somewhat have to hide behind their, hide their beliefs away from public sight. Why do you think that, well, first of all, do you think, how, how much do you really think that's true, or were you erecting that as a straw man, and, and if so, why is it true? Well, it, it's not true in, in my country. It's not true, I suspect, in most parts of Europe. Um, I don't live in America, and so I'm really relying upon reports from America, from my American friends, from many correspondents in America. I have had a lot of letters from American atheists who say uh, to me something like, thank you for writing your article in whatever journal it was. You've expressed exactly my thoughts. I wish I dared express them myself, but I don't dare because I would be, um, I'd, I'd lose my wife or my job mm. or, my, or my parents would disown me. It's really quite shocking the number of letters to that effect that I have received. Hmm. Yes, I, I was, uh, I was uh, amazed as you were writing to some of the stories that you, that you received. Well, okay, so is there, I mean, is there a middle ground? Because that, that is something that I, at least in my introduction to you, suggested that you were not in favor of a, of a meeting of the minds. Uh, but maybe you can say that for yourself. This is where it gets really interesting because the majority of my scientific colleagues, uh, who, who, by the way, are atheists, nevertheless do respect the middle ground and uh, go out of their way to try to, in a sense, woo the middle ground. That's to say, sensible, decent, uh, religiously sophisticated believers who uh, are not creationists, they believe in evolution. So, I mean, they've got some kind of education, uh, but they do believe in God, and they, they might believe that God perhaps uh, started evolution off and then um, let it run, or perhaps designed the genetic code in such a way that evolution would be likely to occur. Now, that, that middle ground is a sort of uh, contested area for um, the political... Um, uh, lobbyists in the American education wars, because there is a war going on between those who are trying to teach creationism in American public schools and those who think that evolution uh, should, is, is the only theory that should be taught in science cl classes about where life comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, in those um, education wars, those science education wars, the middle ground, the people who believe in evolution, are wooed by, in a sense, both sides, and there is a strong evolution lobby, a strong science lobby, many of whose individual luminaries are themselves atheists, but they bend over backwards to be nice to what I've called the sensible middle-of-the-road theists who also believe in evolution, because they want to isolate the creationist, and I think that's a... I can well see that that is a very um, tactically, politically savvy thing to do, it isn't my way, and I come in for a lot of criticism from some of my scientific colleagues because of that, because they feel that I'm rocking the boat and, um, as it were, giving aid and comfort to the creationists. And uh, I think, in a way, they might have a point, because I, I have heard that some, t that some creationists love to quote people like me uh, because it lends weight to their claim that if you are an evolutionist, that means that you have to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, th th this is a matter of American politics. I'm not deeply involved in American politics. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with what's true. For me, the evolution-creation war is really just a battle. It's a skirmish in a larger war between supernaturalism and naturalism. And I don't think that I'm prepared to compromise on what I think is true in order to win a tactical battle in a skirmish in what I see as a larger war. Okay. Uh, I, would comp I would take the entire discussion, but I feel like I, I promised our listeners that they could have a chance, and so let's hear from some of them. And we'll